Peace and blessings. In this series, I will be looking at doctrines that bear false witness against God, beginning with eternal torment. Now, the average lifespan is 73 years, and this is consistent with what we see in the Bible also for the most part. So eternal torment says that God is going to burn people in hell forever for 70 years worth of evil. But what did God say? In Genesis 2 and 17, when God told Adam not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he says that in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. And after Adam has eaten from it in Genesis 3, 19, he says, for dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. So the penalty for disobedience is death. Now I want to make an appeal from logic to you. Does eternal zombieism qualify as death? I don't think so. I think that you would have to be alive to be tormented forever. And life is not granted to the wicked. Per Ezekiel 18, John 17, John 3, 16, and several other scriptures. So let's look at hell. The first Greek word for hell that I want to look at is Hades. It says the abode of departed spirits. So in Acts 2.27, Peter quotes a Psalm of David that says, Because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And in verse 31, he applies this verse to Yeshua, saying he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So the Psalm that Peter quoted is Psalm 16, verse 10, which brings us to the Hebrew word for hell. That word is Sheol, which means underworld, place to which people descend at death. Now, in the books of Kings and Chronicles, when the kings die, it says that they slept with their fathers. And this is applied universally to all of the kings, whether they be wicked kings like King Ahaz or righteous kings like his son Hezekiah. So I want to take a look at where it is that these people actually went. In Daniel 12, Daniel is being told about the resurrection. And verse 2 says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So this confirms God's word in Genesis 3 concerning returning to the dust. And it also tells us that Sheol is the earth, which if you're watching this, you're probably old enough to have seen someone descend there. Now I want to look at 1 Samuel 28. And this is where Saul goes to a woman with a familiar spirit to have her call up Samuel after he has died. In verse 12, it says, And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw God ascending out of the earth. So this woman sees Samuel coming out of the earth. So this confirms that Hades or Sheol is the grave where people descend at death. So next, I want to look at the use of hell in Matthew 10, verse 28. It says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So this word hell is Gehenna, and it refers to an actual physical place outside of Jerusalem called the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. Now, Yeshua said that this is the place where the body and soul are to be destroyed. So before I look at the uses of this in the Old Testament, I want to look at the word soul. The Greek is suke, which means breath or the soul. And in Genesis 2 verse 7, it says, And Yahuwah Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And this word soul is nefesh, a soul, living being, life, self, person. So the soul is not something that you have. The soul is what you are. So what Yeshua was actually saying is that your entire being will be destroyed in Gehenna. So now let's look at Gehenna. In 2 Chronicles 28, we get the detail of Ahaz, Hezekiah's father's life. And in verse three, it says, Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen. So this valley of Hinnom is the place where the wicked of the children of Israel would go and make their children pass through the fire 
to these heathen false gods. And this is pretty much the exclusive use of this place in the Old Testament. Now in Jeremiah 19, Yahuwah tells us a future use that he has for this place. Starting verse 5, they have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith Yahuwah, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of them that seek their lives. And their carcasses will I give to be meat for the fowls of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. Verse 11, thus saith Yahuwah Sabaoth, even so will I break this people and this city as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Tophet till there be no place to bury. So this confirms Yeshua's word of this being a place of destruction because he changes the name of it from Gehenna to the Valley of Slaughter. So this again is not a place of eternal torment. It is the final resting place or Sheol reserved for the wicked. Next, I want to look at Matthew 8 verse 11 says, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We also see outer darkness in Matthew 13, verse 42, Matthew 22, verse 13, and Matthew 25, verse 30. In other places, he also makes references to people being outside, beating on the door after it closes. And in John 7, he tells the Pharisees that they would look for him, but they would not find him for where he is going. They cannot come. Now in Luke 1 verse 78, it says through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So we see here this darkness is the shadow of death. And this is exemplified in the Exodus because Yahuwah told Moses that he would pass through at midnight and smite the firstborn. And any house where he didn't see the blood of the lamb on their door would have been under the shadow of death. So next, I want to look at Revelation 21, verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. So we see that there is an eternal light in this city. But outside of this city, you would expect there to be darkness. Now in Revelation 22, verse 14, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right of the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. So now we know who is outside beating on the door trying to get in. And in Revelation 14, we find out what happens to these people. Verse 19 says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. And blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So these people without the city, beating on the door, are trying to escape the wrath of God. So this also is not a place of eternal torment. It is a place of temporary torment as you are awaiting impending doom. But after that, it's just death. Finally, I want to look at the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 7 says, he that overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And Revelation 20, 10 says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, 
where the beast and the false prophet are, and she'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we see that the people that are cast into this lake of fire, to them, it is the second death. But when the devil is cast here, to him, it is eternal torment. So there's a separation there. And back in Revelation 14, verse 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So here it says the smoke of their torment ascends forever and they have no rest day nor night. But we already saw that these people receive the second death in the lake of fire. So while they're burning, indeed, that is torment. But eventually the body and the soul is destroyed there. So this smoke of their torment is explained in Isaiah 34, starting verse 8. For it is the day of Yahuwah's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. So we see here that the smoke going up forever speaks to the permanence of their destruction. None of this by any means speaks of eternal torment. So now I want to address the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. In this parable, when Lazarus dies, he goes to Abraham's bosom. But when the rich man dies, he goes to a place of torment. So in verse 23, we learn that this place is Hades. And we've already seen that Hades is the grave. But this parable says that the rich man is being tormented in Hades while also talking to Abraham, even though there is a great gulf between them, according to verse 26. Now, Psalm 146 verse 4 tells us, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. And Psalm 115 verse 17 says, The dead praise not Yahuwah, neither any that go down into silence. And we also see this word for silence used in Psalm 94, where it says, Unless Yahuwah had been my help, soon my soul would have settled in silence. So again, this is speaking of death, and it tells you that in that death, you have silence. So we know that you are not being physically tormented in death because your body goes back to dust. And there also is no dreamlike state of torment either, according to this. So what we have here is the introduction of a Greek line of thought. And where does this thought come from? This line of thought comes from the first book of Enoch. Chapter 22, verse 9 says, At that time, therefore, I inquired respecting him and respecting the general judgment, saying, Why is one separated from another? He answered, Three separations have been made between the spirits of the dead, and thus have the spirits of the righteous been separated, namely by a chasm, by water, and by light above it. And in the same way, likewise, are sinners separated when they die and are buried in the earth, judgment not overtaking them in their lifetime. Here their souls are separated. Moreover, abundant is their suffering until the time of great judgment, the castigation and the torment of those who eternally execrate, whose souls are punished and bound there forever. And verse 14 says, A receptacle of this sort has been formed for the souls of unrighteous men and of sinners, of those who have completed crime and associated with the impious whom they resemble. Their souls shall not be annihilated in the day of judgment, neither shall they arise from this place. So this is in contradiction to what the scriptures say concerning the dead going down in silence and their thoughts perishing. And considering that Luke's account is the only witness that we have for this parable, I don't believe that Yeshua actually said this. It is more likely that this is a pagan insertion into the text. Now, while we're here in Enoch, I want to look at chapter 68, because in this chapter, we see a judgment on angels. 
Verse one says, after this judgment shall be astonished and irritated for it shall be exhibited to the inhabitants of the earth. And then it proceeds to give you a list of the names of angels who sinned. And verse 38 says, they blessed, glorified and exalted because the name of the son of man was revealed to them. He sat upon the throne of his glory and the principal part of the judgment was assigned to him, the son of man. Sinners shall disappear and perish from the face of the earth while those who seduce them shall be bound with chains forever. This particular excerpt brings me to the last usage of hell that I want to look at. And it is found in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, where it says that God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. This word hell is Tartaru, which means to cast into hell, and it says, I thrust down to Tartarus or Gehenna. In the Helps Word Studies, down at the bottom, it says, in Greek mythology, Tartarus was a place of punishment under the earth to which, for example, the Titans were sent. So we see here that this is also based on a Greek line of thoughts from the book of Enoch also. And personally, I don't take the book of Enoch to be scripture. Because of that Greek line of thought that it has in it, including this doctrine of eternal torment, and particularly because of this whole ordeal of angels mating with women and polluting the earth. I don't believe this, and I'll go into why I don't believe this in a future study. But for now, based on all this, I'm going to side with David, who said that Yah's mercy endures forever and ruled this doctrine of eternal torment as slander. So thank you again for joining me. Feel free to drop any comments, concerns, agreements, or disagreements in the comment section below. I hope that this study has blessed you and inspired you to search further into Yah's word. May Yahuwah bless you and keep you. May Yahuwah shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.